There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I am here with a Friday Reads, which I didn't promise you, but... I am now able to announce that I'm far enough along with my moving stuff that basically the worst of it's over and I can kind of relax and enjoy my last month in Tokyo. So I will be, unless something unexpected happens, I will be resuming regular Friday reads and all that good stuff. So yay. Uh, yeah, things have gone quite well. The movers came and picked up our stuff last Sunday. Here is a before and after photo. And so we didn't take much, and most of it was books, but it was only about 150 books. And it just fit in for the minimum charge, so it won't cost mom and dad an arm and a leg and another leg, but only an arm and a leg to move that much stuff across the pond. I won't see any of it probably till Christmas, including my computer, so I'm now f doing everything, including my Zoom chats, on my iPad, and that's all working out pretty well. And... After that happened, I realized, you know, I've only got a year and a half left of paperwork to do for my taxes, and then there's the bureaucratic nonsense of going to the office with a friend to help me file it, and I'm not going to talk about it because it's boring and it's just going to jump start my blood pressure, <laughs> but I think it's all going to work out, and you know, at this point, I don't care. If I leave the country with unpaid taxes because they're being such assholes, I mean, I'm being childish because I didn't file them on time, but they're also being complete assholes about not wanting to talk to me and having to make an appointment two weeks in advance and this and that. So I'm not sure it's all going to work out and that's all I'm going to say about it, but I have done the best I could and life's too short to worry about it. So I'm in a superlatively good mood and here comes a mother with her kid to play on the playground, which I'm sitting on the edge of a pl the playground, so it's probably going to get a little noisier. Shogunai. Shogunai means can't be helped. I'm not moving. <laughs> Dude, I'm so excited about moving. And, uh, and it's funny now, because now Kenji's stressed. Because I've been working on get my, getting my move. For me, 75% of my move was the books. And that's done. I've got maybe, i got four more boxes packed up to take to the post office later today. And then maybe two more boxes after that to mail. So the books are done. And that was 75% of my move, so I'm in good shape. Meanwhile, Kenji's stressed, and I think he's got lots of time to do what he needs to do, but <laughs> he's feeling stressed. He could have started doing his stuff a little earlier. Other than to say Roe v. Wade, that's just so disgusting. America is just a shithole of a country for women, and um, it's probably the beginning of the end of gay marriage, and I don't want to sound too cynical, but white americans need to vote for fuck's sakes this is uh, some people are blaming rbg and i think she did make a fairly fatal error in not resigning under obama but you know there's lots of presidents that said they were going to enshrine abortion rights in the constitution and they didn't do that or what i'm not sure of all the terminology but there's lots of blame to go around, but I blame white American women for voting Trump in because that's why we're in this mess. So, I mean, white men too, but when have we ever been able to <laughs> rely on white men to do anything? So I'm furious about that. And there's not a whole lot I can do as a gay white Canadian in Japan, but other than to just emote. The Americans of yous all go vote. I will just emote. I have finished five books, so let me tell you about those. I finished later the same day of my last Friday Reads, the Welsh, one of the Welsh novels that I've been reading. It was called, I, I've already gotten rid of my copy, so I think you know that this is not gonna be a, it's gonna be a fairly mediocre review because I've already disposed of it. It's called Creed by Margaret Evans. Margaret Evans is the author of Country Dance. It's one of the best novellas I've ever read. And unfortunately, she was a one-hit wonder vis-a-vis Sean the Book Maniac's reading taste because I hated this one. I really disliked this one. I gave it two stars. And I hated Turf or Stone. And I think that's all she's written. So or that's available anyway. So I think I'm done with Margiette Evans. There was just nothing that really held my interest. It was so short that I didn't bail, but I'm kind of wishing that I hadn't wasted 
however many three or four hours it took to read it because I didn't care about the characters. As one would expect with Welsh literature, especially of this era, I think it was published in about 1936, a lot of stuff about the church and religion and sinning and I just don't give a shit about any of that. So I don't know why I'm so interested in Welsh lit. Yeah, it was awful. So that happened. Uh, everything else I have to say is overwhelmingly positive. So let's keep going here. I have finally, finally finished volume two of the three volume audiobook of Samuel Richardson's Clarissa. Each of the three volumes being 34 hours. So I finally finished that yesterday. And oh my God, it's just such a wonderful novel. It's really one of the most incisive and uh, in a way ponderous. It's not too much for me, but it's, you know, it doesn't really have to be 700,000 pages long. But what a portrait of misogyny and male control. I mean, it's actually, I, I didn't think of this until right now, but it was really the perfect read while digesting the news, the potential end of Roe v. Wade and people, women have been forced into backyard abortions because it's so much about men controlling the, the protagonist, the eponymous protagonist, Clarissa, and it's so richly psychological and infuriating. I think I, what I've appreciated now that I've finished volume two of three of the audiobook is what an incredibly violent, misogynistic story it is. I, I think I was seduced by her quote-unquote boyfriend slash captor for much of volume one. I wasn't quite sure whether he was just playing a game or was he really a bad guy because he would talk out of both sides of his mouth and I'm certainly have made up my mind about uh, just blanked on his name but uh, what is his name Mr. Lovelace uh, there's no nuance in my feelings about Mr. Lovelace now that I've got through two-thirds of it I'm gonna take a break from Clarissa I will pick it up sometime after I get back to Canada and last night I finished Butter Honey Peg Bread by Francesca Ekoyasi, a queer Canadian Nigerian writer. And I think I started this in January. I don't remember when I started it. I loved it so much. Could be my book of the year. It's certainly gonna be in my top five or whatever. I'm so glad I read it so slowly because I never lost the thread of it. If I can use a cooking metaphor because it's as much about cooking as anything else just to let the chapter simmer for a week or 10 days before picking it up again was really the way to go with this one. So moving, so queer, so sensual. One of the things that I loved about this was that most of the male characters, except for one absolute villain who caused a lot of traumatic damage to the women in the story, but the, the other men that, that, that these women were in relationships with the women that were interested in relationships with the man, that is, were really richly drawn and decent, nice people. I love the complexity and attractiveness of the men because it's really hard to write men in a complex way and make them still attractive as people, as personalities, and she really pulled it off. There were a couple things that made it seem like a debut, but for the most part, it was a profound novel and an incredible achievement. A little bit, I'm not sure if the word self-indulgent, but there was a little bit too much self-helpy talk for some of the characters, but 5% excessive, take, if taken that 5% out, but no, certainly nothing that would make me bring it down from a five-star read. I just loved it. It was so moving, it made me hungry, it made me horny, it made me want to give everyone around me a hug. So many of the books I'm talking about are about loneliness, isolation, and the inability or failure to connect. And uh, this one explores that through the lives of the uh, mother and her two daughters, twin daughters, one who is queer, the other who is straight, the trauma in the family, and the miscommunication in the family, but then the way that plays itself out in the love lives of the daughters. It seemed near the end like it was going to end too happily for my taste, but no, nope, no, nope. it was a realistic ending, a beautiful ending. I was all verklempt, butter, honey, pig, bread. Probably not for vegetarians to, to enjoy. <laughs> a lot about eating meat and butchering animals, and I loved all that too. 
And now for something completely different. I finally finished this History of the Ku Klux Klan in Canada by Alan Bartley. And I ended up giving it four stars. I was, it was sitting at about a three, but the second half was so much more engaging than the first half. It wasn't that well written, but it was chock full of fascinating information that just enraged me and in, in a sense also entertained me. The KKK pre about 1980s was just a complete fuck up in Canada. They barely did anything that was violent. They certainly intimidated non-white and Catholic and Jewish people. But mostly it was a tale of corruption. Almost every leader, and many of them came from the States, just pocketed all the membership money they collected. And there was very little, you know, burned a cross or two once a year, here, there, and everywhere across Canada, but didn't uh, do much else. So it was just a tale of complete and utter losers. Except in Saskatchewan, and this was an eye-opener for me, the only pre-1980s, the only place in Canada where they had enough political power to actually affect legislative politics and turn an election was in Saskatchewan in the late 1920s. So my grandparents, uh, my dad's parents were farmers at that time, and I just wonder how one of the lecture tours where the the anti-racist liberal premier of Saskatchewan was doing lectures against the KKK and the KKK leader showed up in the audience and challenged him to a debate. That meeting, not the debate, but the, the, cha the meeting where the challenge was issued was in Rosetown, Saskatchewan. That is like a 30 minute drive from my parents' farm. In, in a, and that was in about 1928 or something. So I had no idea how enmeshed they were in Saskatchewan's political culture in the 1920s. And in fact, the government was booted out and it was the KKK vote that brought the Conservatives in, in 1929. And that is the only place, according to this book, where they actually affected an election. The KKK all but disappeared in the 1930s and then the resurgence came because of David Duke in the States, whenever, what one was that, what, 1980 or late 70s? And then they were much more violent, did a lot, wreaked a lot more havoc, actually committed murders and so on. Um, not tens of thousands or nothing like what happened in the Deep South in terms of numbers of people affected, but certainly it was awful and they, they were connected to the skinheads and so on. There was so many fascinating anecdotes. They weren't necessarily all that well told, but it did end up being a book that uh, affected me and educated me. And I'm really glad that I know this information because I have two other connections to the KKK. That sounds bad. Let me rephrase that. I have two other geographical co connections to the KKK. Bigger Saskatchewan is also about a 40 minute drive from my parents' farm and it was and I had heard rumors that it was a KKK stronghold and there's quite a bit about that and that was back in the 1920s. There was nothing about whether that is still the case today, but certainly in the 1920s. And also Caroline, Alberta, where my cousin lived on a farm or a ranch and the next neighbor, ranching neighbor, had a swastika on his barn. And every time we'd drive by, I would get so upset and angry, like, what the fuck? And it's quite a bit about him. I assume it's him somebody long in the book so and he did do a lot of terrible evil violent stuff and that was my cousin's neighbor so whenever I've mentioned this book on my channel I get all kinds of comments from Americans expressing incredulity that the KKK was in Canada they very much were that it was mostly laughable but they have done some damage and certainly and I guess the failing I couldn't give this certainly five stars because it wasn't that well written but I also felt like the untold story that I, and maybe it's impossible to tell the story, was that they, the reception that white Canadians, white Protestant Canadians gave the KKK and their ideas, even if they maybe didn't approve of their tactics, but they were so threatened by the Ukrainians coming, the Ukrainian Catholics coming from Europe and the uh, Italians and uh, whatever. And then never mind from the Middle East or India or so on. This 
fucked up message resonated with a lot of white Canadians. And that's the story that I don't think this book told very well. And, what, and maybe, how do you tell that story? But it echoed the sentiment. And that sentiment is still very much there. Canada is an incredibly racist country today. So this book helped me understand some of the historical roots of that. So it wasn't an enjoyable read. It was an important read. And I'm done. Uh, the last book I finished was the Welsh novel, Hello, Friend, We Missed You by Robert Owain Roberts. And I heard him, I found a video where he was doing a little, uh, what do you call it, trailer for this novel. And he said his name, and Owain is really fast. It's not Owain, but I can't remember how he pronounced it. I'll put, put the little clip of him pronouncing his own name in right here. Hi, um, I'm Richard Owain Roberts. This is my novel, Hello, Friend, We Missed You. Um, I'm originally from Anismol. Being born and raised uh, on the island um, is hugely influential in how I see the world and I think it's got like the, the rural side to it. I loved it. It was strange in a way that really worked for me. There was some parts in the middle where I was wondering if it was going to end up working for me and it very much did but I, it's one of those what the hell did I just read kind of novels. It's very millennial and I think most millennial fiction is far better than anything that's come before it. And this was one that was really excellent. And the indirect... I am going to move because I can't sit here. I'll, I'll show you where I've been sitting. And I can't sit here anymore. My legs are cramping up and my back's getting sore. The sun has gone behind a cloud. I'm gonna move over to the bench that was too sunny for me. So this is where I was sitting, but way too low for me. All right, and I forgot that I brought my glasses. Put them in my, I haven't been wearing them. And now the sun's come back out, so I'm, I'm not moving again. So I'll be squinty maybe, but. All right. Yes, Richard Owain Roberts. It was the indirect narration that was so powerful, but I don't think it would work for many a reader. Apparently this is a real Marmite book because the main emotional events are only gestured towards never narrated head on. And that was the most glaringly weird in that the protagonist, Hill, comes back to Wales, I believe from America, because his father, I, was, I thought it was his stepfather, but now all the reviews are calling him his father, but he doesn't call him his father, he calls him Roger. And I was pretty sure that was because he was his stepfather, but anyway. That's, leaving that aside, he's dying. And Hill comes back because he's dying. And he's living in the house on Anglesey, now known by its Welsh name, which is an island. Although if you just glance at a map of Wales, it doesn't look like an island, but yes, it is an island. And it's now known as Innismon, I believe is the pronunciation. And that's where Hill grew up. And his mother committed suicide some years ago and the house was left to Roger for his use during his life, but then would go to the son after. And we never see, other than flashbacks from when Hill was a child, in the present of the novel, we never see Hill and Roger interact. There's some flashbacks to when he was a kid, but other than that, you hear him coughing in the next room, and instead, Hill gets uh, sexually, romantically, emotionally involved with the carer who lives part-time with Roger and has her own place. And she was a child TV star in a Welsh language children's show, so she's a little bit famous. And most of the novel is taken up with their relationship. So that that indirectness is really uncomfortable in a way that ultimately was productive for me, that worked for me. Similarly, uh, we don't get a whole bunch about what the suicide was about of his mother and his wife. Oh. Hill's wife had died. I never quite got a sense of what, how, she, how she died or whatever, and there's a whole bunch of unresolved grief. Compounded layer, you know, layers of grief, and Hill is not emotionally attuned. He is not attuned to his emotions and uh, Trudy, the, the live-in carer, who's a very strange person, but ultimately I was won over by her by the end. Just trying to kind of help him because he's got anticipatory grief and 
grief about his wife, grief about his mother, and he is just kind of la 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 la. And that's basically the story. So it's told in a really offhand way, but I was utterly fascinated by it. I don't think I got everything. It's a novel that I might even reread as soon as later this year. And uh, Richard Owen Roberts, there's a short story collection I want to check out. And so this is one that Scott of Gunpowder Fiction and Plot and I agree on. I haven't rewatched his review, but it was his video review that sold me on it. I don't know if I loved the same things he did because I can't remember what he loved now, but I loved this. Probably the thing to do is check out a Kindle preview or something and see if you connect with the writing style because I don't think it would be for everybody. I'm excited by all the things this book made me think about and feel. So that's what I have read. I started a couple. The books I'm reading to Lindy and to Kendra. I am reading, and this is also one of my booktube spin books, a queer short story collection, Kiss the Scars on the Back of My Neck by Joe Okonkwo. I've now read maybe three and a half stories, and only one of them had a strong impact on me. It was one of the gayest of the stories, and it was about a second date. I believe it was a second date that went horribly wrong once they got into the bedroom. And there was something really raw and powerful about the way that was all described that I very much related to, and I'm not going to share any personal anecdotes at this time, but Lindy and I both agreed that it was just an incredibly potent story that just got right down to, to the pain that can be caused when you really like somebody, but then it doesn't work sexually and then you're left with just loneliness and you're berating yourself. Why can't I be attracted to this person? Because everything else about this person is great. It's a very human experience that was really beautifully rendered in this story. The other ones have been bad or not that great. So I'm not sure how I will feel by the end. Based on the one really powerful story, I'm certainly gonna keep reading. And the Hilary Mantel memoir, Giving Up the Ghost, I know this is also a bit of a Marmite memoir, and I can see why. The first chapter, maybe the first two chapters, just blew me away, and the, her prose is a joy to read aloud. I do particularly well as an audio, quote-unquote, narrator with long, complex sentences. I just love reading those that kind of prose aloud, and that's Hilary Mantel's prose style. But I'm not as connected with it now. A little bit too self-indulgent about kind of her own private mythology as a child and her exploring that on the page in a way that as a reader I just don't care about the rabbit holes that she writes her way down into. Not as interesting as the actual story because I mean Hilary Mantel's childhood was fascinating. Her, She basically grew up for a few years in a menage a trois situation between her parents and her mother's lover and they all lived in the same house for a while. And so that's pretty, in, you know, in the 1940s or whatever it was. So that's pretty darn interesting. And yet, I find Mantel is going off in directions where I'm reading two and a half pages of this very private, and I don't mean it's too much information, not that kind of private, but where it's, it has some meaning to her privately that I just don't really care about. Just I'd rather that she get back to the story or make, she makes fabulously wise observations about human nature and gender and all this stuff in telling the story. Uh, that's what I want to read. I don't want to read about the kind of more poetic uh, deep dives into what this color and this image from a childhood dream and how that it, it not, not not that part's not for me. So we'll see how it goes. I'm about 40 percent. I'm exactly 40 percent of the way through it. So those two are in progress. And I haven't had a bail in a long time. My last bail was uh, the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, which is apparently a favorite to win the, what, Pulitzer or something? Didn't work for me. So I finished, what did I say, maybe five? Yeah, I finished five, but I'm only gonna start two this week. I, I'm gonna get my current reads down not to zero, but get it down substantially. So maybe for every two I finish, I'll start one book so that I can start a whole bunch of new books on the plane or, you know, in June, I think I'm gonna go nuts with a Pride TBR. So I'm gonna kind of clear a space for that. So let me tell you about the two books I'm gonna start. 
because I'm kind of ahead of the game, I'm, I'm planning to participate a little bit in the Asian readathon. So here is the novel by the Korean American novelist, Paul Yoon, Run Me to Earth. And this is set in Laos in the 1960s. I read the opening chapter to Lindy during our concussion reading project over the Christmas holidays, and we both really liked it. It's a short one, so I'm gonna start that. Really looking forward to it, based on how well it started out. And this is the last of my Irish TB, <laughs> Irish readathon TBR from, was it February, March? March. The John McGairn memoir, All Will Be Well. So those are what I'm going to start. I have been thinking about what I want to do because I'm now able to re-immerse myself in reading and basically do the same amount of reading that I always did. I'm no longer having to, ra you know, uh, get by on 20 minutes a day of reading. Well, that feels wonderful. So what do I want to do now that I can kind of get back to my bibliomanic life? I'm really undecided about picking back up with Invisible Cities. I like the idea of it, but it ends up kind of taking over my, my reading. I love researching and finding the books and so on, but then, you know, at least 50% of the time I hate the book, bail on it. I think I might only participate when I have a book or know of a book that I'm dying to read that happens to be from that country and otherwise just kind of ignore it because ultimately it's it's just too much for me right now. And I'm feeling the same way about readathons. And uh, it's not that I don't love readathons. Oh my God, I love readathons so much. But I think I'm going to be more minimalist in my participation. Like maybe read one or two for the Asian readathon. Pride, I think I'm going to go a little crazy. But you know, for other readathons, Caribathon is also in June. And I've, I've got one book that I'm looking forward to doing for that. And that's probably enough. And just kind of focus on the books that I have. I have kept back about 40 or 50 books that are going in my suitcases and my carry-on luggage and I just want to read those and a lot of them come from the concussion read reading project Lindy and I did and I've held those back so that I can get to them and they're not going to necessarily fit into a readathon but they are feeling like high priority reads for me so that's what I think I'm gonna do but that's all I'm still thinking about everything on that happy note this was great to do a outdoor Friday reads and I'm I'm not sure if I'll do one on my very last Friday in Japan because it's the day before I go and I may be busy but certainly the next two Fridays you will see me and not sure about May 27th I'll play that one by ear and that's all I got thanks for watching